Howdy folks, Keith Bowen here and this is Hard Rock University. Today's lesson is crushing and grinding. This is going to be general crushing and grinding, not for a specific application. Now the question is, why do you crush and grind? Crushing is basically taking big rocks and turning them into little rocks or gravel. Grinding is taking little rocks or gravel and turning it into sand or powder. When you're dealing with extractive metallurgy, getting metals out of rocks, you have to separate them. And in order to separate them, there's a variety of possibilities. One is to physically separate them. To actually take the particles of one mineral and separate them from the particles of another. In order to do that, first you have to break them apart, then you can sort them. That's why you have to crush and grind. Another thing you can do is dissolve them. And in order to dissolve a mineral particle, the solution has to get to the mineral particle and if it's inside the rock, get away from it again back into the bulk solution. The smaller the mineral particles, the easier it is for the solution to access the valuable minerals. And in general, if you're trying to maximize the speed of a leach, you want to crush it to the point where each valuable mineral particle has at least one surface exposed to the solution. This is called mineral exposure. If you're trying to physically separate them, then you need to get to the point of crushing where you get mineral liberation. You've crushed it so fine that essentially every particle is either one thing or another. You don't have two different types of minerals stuck together anymore because the particle sizes are just too small. Now, various grinds and various crushing works differently for different processes. For example, if you're doing a heap leach, you wouldn't grind. You would just crush. And you might crush to a fairly modest size, inch and a half, inch and a quarter, something like that fairly small, half an inch, three quarters. If you have a lot of fine materials when you do this, then you're going to have to probably agglomerate it or mix it with like cement or something like that, damp, roll it a little bit to make everything stick together into porous particles. Otherwise, when you stack it in the heap, you're gonna get fine particle beds that are gonna deflect your leach solutions and you're gonna have a lot of areas that are not thoroughly leached. Everything else, you're pretty much just going to crush it down to the point where the process that you desire to use is going to work. And that is completely and utterly ore dependent. Let me show you the basic layout of a grinding circuit. Here we have a basic crushing and grinding circuit. The first thing you have is a grizzly. A grizzly is a grate of some sort to prevent oversized material from plugging up the process. If your crusher can only accept 6 inch rocks, you might need a 5 inch grizzly. If you've got a, <laughs> a very large mine where you're dumping 300 ton truckloads in, there's no real grizzly. The gyratory crusher has a rock breaker and it acts as its own screen. If it doesn't go through, it gets broken in the pocket. But most processes will have a grizzly, and especially a micro scale or a small scale mine will have a grizzly to keep oversized rocks, timbers, rock bolts, anything like that out of the process. From the grizzly, you go to what's known as a primary crusher. The primary crusher takes the largest rocks fed into the circuit and crushes them up. Now, above the grizzly, you may have a rock breaker or a guy with a sledgehammer or whatever to make them small enough, but the primary crusher takes your what you call run of mine material and breaks it into smaller rocks. In a micro scale operation, that will generally be a fairly small crusher and its output will be fairly small. But in a larger operation, the output of the primary crusher may be six inches minus. And therefore, you may have a secondary crusher or even tertiary or quaternary 
crushers depending upon the size of the input and the circuit you're trying to create. But secondary crushing basically takes the output of the primary crusher and reduces it to the size that's good to feed into your grinding circuit, whatever that is. On a micro scale, quite often the primary crusher grows direct to the grinding circuit. The grinding circuit then crushes it to your final uh, usable size. For example, if you're doing a flotation process, it might be 80% 100 mesh minus or something like that. Now, that's a phrase that's used a lot in crushing and grinding. 80% means that 80% of the material is on that side of the screen once you screen it. Uh, when I say 80% 100 mesh minus, it means you've got a 100 mesh screen and 80% of the material will go through it, 20% will be rejected off of it. So that would also be 20% 100 mesh plus. Now the stuff that's rejected by the screen is called the oversize. Now in many processes you have what's known as recirculation in your grinding. Any oversize will get recirculated to the previous phase for regrinding. It's very common. It's not necessary in all operations. However, this is a very common circuit here. The grinding circuit, in order to get, say, 95% passing 100 mesh in a single pass, you're going to be grinding very, very thoroughly and using a lot of energy and wear and creating a lot of fines potentially unnecessarily. If a single quick pass through your grinding circuit gives you 80% minus, then just screen it and send the other 20% back. Things will go a lot faster. You'll increase your throughput, you'll decrease your undersize, your, your uh, overgrind as they call it. Particles that are smaller than desirable. If it's really small, it can cause problems. It can be hard to settle out of your water, hard to filter out, so, as a general rule, you want a particular particle range to feed into your extraction process. Not too much oversize, sometimes not any oversize, and not too much undersize or overgrind. Okay, the undersize typically means whatever comes through the screen, but it can also mean whatever is below the optimal uh, grind size. Okay, it just means below a particular size. I will try and use the word overgrind to indicate stuff that's ground finer than you want it to be. Now, as a general rule, in a flotation process or a gravity separation, you want to really minimize the overgrind. Especially in a gravity separation, a large low density particle acts very similar to a small high density particle. So you want as much as possible the particle sizes to be the same so that they will easily differentiate by density. If you've got a lot of really fine dense particles and really big light particles, it may be difficult to impossible to get a good separation using a gravity process. Flotation processes are less um, sensitive to this. Good spargers and violent agitation will get the very fine particles to attach to the bubbles pretty well. And in a leaching process, overgrind really isn't a problem in the leaching, but it can be in the filtration or, you know, for leach solution recycling, or if you're going to do zinc precipitation. There's a number of things where it can be a problem, but generally, much less so than in gravity circuits. If you're using a gravity circuit, you really want to minimize your overgrind. Now, let's talk about various types of crushers. These are your four common types of crushers. Crusher being, again, something that makes small rocks out of bigger rocks. Gyratory crushers have a hard steel mantle and I believe they call it the mandrel, <laughs> in the middle. And this cycles around like this. The rock is fed here, and as it gets crushed, it works its way down, eventually comes out through that gap. 
gyratory crushers in general are very large. They are the primary crushers in big mines where they take entire truckloads up to 350 tons and dump them into the crusher pocket at once. Uh, so these can be as large as eight stories tall, you know, $20 million, and take six to 12 months to build. These really aren't applicable to what we're doing as micro or small scale gold miners. A jaw crusher, on the other hand, has two plates of steel. We get closer together. One or more of them moves. All modern jaw crushers that I'm aware of, only one jaw moves, although in the old times they used to have both jaws moving to get a little more. Thing. This jaw will have an eccentric shaft here usually and a toggle plate on the bottom. You can have it the other way with the eccentric on the bottom and the toggle on the top. This allows you to have a pretty small gap here. Generally the kind of jaw crusher you're going to use in a small scale operation because you get a small output. Um, our Keen RC46 puts out quarter inch minus. So we can take four inch rocks, turn them into quarter inch rocks, a 16 to 1 size reduction in a single pass. This jaw moves back and forth at this point here, pivoting on the bottom toggle plate. And as the rock wedges in, it gets crushed, drops a little further, gets crushed, and works its way down and out. By the way, that's hard to visualize. Wikipedia has a nice article on crushers that actually has moving crusher illustrations. It's very nice. Jaw crushers have a number of advantages. They're fairly compact. You have a, a crusher that's only maybe two to three times larger than the largest rock it will accept. That's pretty small size. Uh, in terms of what it can do, it's fairly lightweight and portable which is good. They're easy to maintain. Um, they're relatively simple. People can actually build a jaw crusher. So they have a lot of advantages. You're going to have wear. So these jaws need to have, be lined with replaceable wear plates and they will usually use hard facing or some other uh, hardened surface on that. They are kind of the industry standard for small to medium size uh, operations you know, up to say a couple hundred tons an hour because they do so well for that. Cone crushers, you have a hole and the mandrel is like this, or I'm in the shell, and here's your crusher here. And this again moves around like that this gap gets steadily smaller as you go down and as this cycles around it crushes these rocks that. Now this is not a primary crusher. Comb crushers are never used as primary crushers because the size reduction is relatively small, the input is relatively small. As such they're almost always well they are always secondary or tertiary crushers. Usually when you have a fairly large mine where the primary crusher produces an output, you know, more than a couple inches in diameter that needs to be crushed further down to go into a ball mill or something like that. These would rarely be applicable to a small, uh, almost never to a micro scale operation. Maybe to a small scale operation, depending upon where you picked one up, if it was used and cheap and you needed a secondary crusher, it might work pretty well on you. Then you have a rolls crusher. You basically have two steel rollers like this. And they're turning in the same direction. You usually have a pulley and a belt drive here. And if the two rollers are in contact, you don't need to mechanically drive the second roller. In a small rolls, we're using it almost as a rolls mill, then these two are pressed together firmly and that gives you enough traction, friction to do the job. Now, if you 
have a gap here, say you're using this as a secondary crusher and you're taking say two inch material and crushing it down to quarter inch or whatever, so you got like a quarter inch gap, there you're going to need to drive the second roll. Now the size of the roller has to be such that the biggest particle gets pretty close in there so that the rolls can actually pinch the rock and drag it through. You try and throw a big rock in here, it, nothing's going to happen. So they have to take a fairly small size for the size of the roll. For example, on our Keen RC46, you have six inch rollers and quarter inch material. But they do a very good job because they're moving at a fairly high speed. They just crush it like nobody's business. Different crushers are determined, I mean, they, they delineate them by various things. The opening size, the largest feed size, the output size, the throughput, pretty much how you'd take a big gyratory crusher. A jaw crusher will be the size of the opening. This dimension versus this dimension here. For example, in our Keen, it's a 4 by 6 inch crusher. 4 inch by 6 inch opening. This, again, is the size of the opening, what size it'll feed, how many tons per hour will go through it, and how much size reduction you get. Rolls crushers, it's the diameter of the rolls by the length of the rolls. A 6 by 12 rolls crusher would be 6 inches in diameter, 12 inches long. In the case of the RC46, they're 6 by 6. And I like the rolls crusher as a secondary crusher or as a coarse mill. They're very energy efficient, very low wear rates. They produce very little overgrind. Once it crushes to a certain amount, it doesn't crush any further. One of the negatives is it has to have a fairly small feed size and it doesn't deal with sticky material very well. If you've got some clay and a little bit of moisture, it'll just turn big flakes coming through here that then have to be kind of broken up again. They may be, the rock particles may be fairly well crushed, but nevertheless, what's coming out isn't individual, it's not going to go over a screen and, and separate well. Now, all of these, depending on how sticky the material is, it may or may not work well. If it's too sticky, you may have to do what they call water flushing. You pour so much water through there that it just turns everything into a thin mud. As it crushes it up, it turns it into a slurry so that it won't stick. And that creates complications. If you don't need it, best not to do it. Um, in our case, we're using a hard rock, a jaw, and a rolls produces sand and powder fairly effectively. Now let's get to mills. Again, a mill takes small rocks or gravel and turns it into sand or a fine powder. The rolls can actually be used as a mill as well as a secondary crusher. By taking the rollers and pushing them hard together and feeding them fairly lightly, uh, you can get a fairly good crush. On the RC46, we'll get, in a single pass, something like 50% passing 30 mesh. We can then take the whole bulk and regrind it immediately, and we'll get 70-75% passing 30 mesh. Since we're doing a gravity separation, and most of our particles are fairly large, uh, that does fairly well for us. That's basically all we need to do to get our preliminary separation and get a good heavy metal cons. So in our case, combination of the RC, the RC46 does very well. We have a jaw to take decent sized rocks up to about fist size and turn them into a particle size that we can use, minimal overgrind, very efficient, single machine, works well. However, sometimes you're, need to, you're going to need to grind it finer and if you start using like the on the RC46 the roller scraper to get a finer grind the wear rates go up astronomically. A lot of your advantages of a rolls crusher are now negated because your wear rates become very high. Uh, 
probably the most common for the micro scale miner is an impact mill. Now, an impact mill, you basically have some kind of a very sturdy steel housing and then some kind of a rotor that spins around at high speed. You feed the ore in and it gets beat to heck very violently. Now, an impact mill has certain advantages, certain disadvantages. Number one, it's a very violent reaction and the harder materials are much less damaged by an impact than softer materials are. So this will tend to grind your minerals differently. You'll create a, a lot more fines of your softer minerals than you will of your harder minerals. Like in our case we have quartz and pyrites. The pyrites turn to dust, the quartz still remains chunks. Bad for gravity separation. Not necessarily bad for a leach. Another thing that can sometimes work well is you run through the impact mill and then screen it. Because if your valuable minerals are soft, they can get turned to powder. The quartz is still chunks, you know, sand and slightly larger. You can screen those out. You might get a 90% upgrade like that simply by screening. So it's worth looking into see whether or not this process works better for you than this process on your particular ore. Everything is always ore dependent. Now, the impact mill is by its nature going to have fairly high wear rates simply because it's a violent abrasive thing. There's a lot of sliding, grinding, hitting, stuff like that. These impactors are going to wear rapidly. The housing can wear rapidly. So you need to have replaceable wear parts wherever it's going to wear. In general, something of this nature, if you're going to use an industrial setting, uh, there's a guy in Casa Grande, uh, Stutenroth, you might have seen his ads. He makes a very nice impact mill. And what he has between the housing and the impactor, he has a bunch of steel bars that slide in through the sides. And so all the wear is the impactors and the steel bars. The housing itself doesn't wear at all. And you can change everything out in about 30 minutes. And this is on an industrial scale mill. I mean, this will do two and a half tons an hour. And wear part change out's about 30 minutes. And I believe it was, uh, I think, one or two hundred dollars in parts. Because again, it's just bar stock. Pretty simple stuff. So, in a production setting, your impact mill has to have replaceable wear parts. And you're going to tend to create a lot of dust. Um, if you're grinding dry, you're going to need some kind of dust collection. Otherwise, you're going to be losing a lot. You're going to be breathing a lot. So you need some kind of a bag house or something like that. Uh, the One of the big advantages to the impact mill is it doesn't tend to plug or cake. So you can take a fairly sticky material, and especially if you're wet grinding it, uh, it'll handle it just fine. It won't be a problem. It won't clump up. It won't stick together and stop anything. You just throw it in there, at, you know, add water, and boom, you wind up with slurry. Works real well. Impact mill has its place. It's a different place than the rolls. Ball mill, you have a large cylinder. It has a bunch of steel balls in it. And as you turn the cylinder, these balls get pulled up, cascade down, and keep doing that. And in the process, they beat the ore to a pulp. Ball mills are very energy efficient, and that's one of the reasons why they use them in the big mines. When you're trying to grind up 200,000 tons a day to 80% passing 100 mesh, ball mill's hard to beat. However, they tend to be very large. I mean, for the throughput, uh, it's, it's a larger thing. I mean, to, to equal uh, an impact mill like Stutenroth has is doing two tons an hour, you're going to need a ball mill, you know, yay big, 
and the weighs, when loaded with balls, several tons. So portability is an issue. Um, size and weight are an issue. Costs, they're kind of hard to build. Uh, you can do it yourself. You can make a small ball mill, but it has its issues. And the one I really don't like is gold doesn't come out of ball mills. If you have any decent sized gold particle at all, you, you feed ore in one end, there's a hole in one end, and then there's a hole in the other end that the slurry comes out. It's tilted just slightly. And the problem is, is that the gold doesn't get out of the ball mill. If you have any decent sized particle of gold at all, it's going to stay in there. It's just like the balls. They don't float out. And so these tend to become a gold trap. You know, not a problem if you're, you know, making, you know, copper concentrates with, with sulfides. But when you're dealing with metallic gold, these will trap it for you. Uh, as a little aside, if you ever get the opportunity to scrap out a ball mill that's been used in a mine that has a lot of gold in it, a copper mine, a gold mine, whatever, always remove all the liners and clean it out very thoroughly because there may be many, many ounces of gold still inside the mill that was trapped over a long period of time and never got out. So a ball mill will generally beat the gold to death before it can get out. If it's a leaching operation, not nearly as much of a problem. Larger, especially if you don't have a gravity scalping circuit on your leech. If you're going to a tank leech, you want to beat the crap out of it before you try and leach it. So if you're doing a tank leaching circuit, maybe not a good thing. If you're doing a gravity circuit, probably not a good thing. So that's, that's part of my issue with ball mills. They're not very compact and portable. A micro scale miner has to be able to move. You may have to move your equipment in and out just for regulatory purposes or your ore body is going to disappear in six months. You're going to mine it all out. You want to be able to take that capital investment and move it easily to the next opportunity. Otherwise, you just got to throw that money away. So you want something that's very portable if at all possible. There's something called an ultrasonic mill. Now this looks kind of like a ball mill. It's a little cylinder. I'm going to do it from the side here. You know, like that. And it's got a vibrator on it. And it vibrates very, very fast. And you put steel balls or ceramic balls in it and it vibrates and it will pulverize the rock pretty well. These are more compact than a ball mill. But they're quite expensive. Or at least the ones I've seen are. I have no experience with them, but I would imagine they're going to do the same thing as a ball mill in terms of they're going to trap any metallic gold. If this is just vibrating, wow, it's just like a vibratory sluice, isn't it? <laughs> so I wouldn't be too comfortable putting one of those in a gravity circuit for gold. Again, maybe for uh, a leaching circuit, not too bad. A disc grinder is like an old-fashioned flour mill. You have two discs one of which is driven and the other which has a feed here and your ore gets fed into the center this disc spins and it grinds it against the other you adjust this gap and they're very good at making a nice fine powder the throughput is the issue in general this is more of a laboratory scale device they use them in the labs all the time for assaying and such However, if you're making a good quality concentrate that you then want to pulverize and leach, this might be a good acceptable way to go. Because if you're doing, oh, say two tons a day, and you're getting a, you know, 95% concentration ratio, so at the end of a day you've got 200 pounds of uh, concentrates then a disc grinder might very well be able to process that in that period of time. Again, it's very small, it's very compact. They're a little bit pricey. A uh, good Bico Braun might be $5,000 brand new. Sometimes you can pick them up real cheap though, on the used market. So if you can get a good disc grinder, cheap on the used market, that might be a very good way to go, especially for concentrates which aren't as abrasive. As you can see, because this is literally just grinding one against the other, your wear rates are going to be pretty high unless it's a fairly soft mineral. A sag mill, it's like a ball mill, 
but larger in diameter. It has lifter bars. I'll draw them on this side. Inside. And it picks the charge up and just really drops it a long distance. And you actually put in large rocks too, you know, like you know, four, five, six inch diameter ore rock. And it works with the balls to grind it up. SAG stands for semi-autogenous grinding. Autogenous means that the rock is grinding itself. The problem with these is they have to be large in diameter. And so a sag mill, I mean the smallest I've heard is like 15 feet in diameter. So don't worry about it for anything less than a whole lot of tons per hour. Stamp mills used to be used in the old days. It's basically just a heavy chunk of steel that would be picked up and dropped. And your material would flow underneath it. Don't have much experience with stamp mills. They pretty much went out of style a long time ago. And I presume that's because they weren't nearly as efficient as some of the other things. All I know is they did work in their day. So somebody might be able to create one like uh, use a, uh, an electric demolition hammer and make a very small stamp mill. Yeah, it's an idea. Now let me show you a little video of some of the different, we've got, you know, impact mill and a uh, jaw crusher and a roll, so show you a little video here and then we'll close out the uh, presentation. This is the pulley, the belt drive from the motor here. Here we have an 11 horsepower Honda gasoline engine. The cross shaft goes through here. It's got eccentric, which moves the movable jaw. There's a flywheel over here to store and release energy during the strokes. And there's also a chain that goes from here down to the roller crusher, which we'll get into in a minute. The rolls crusher is driven off of this, and so it's a very simple operation. Now I'm just going to hand crank this over a little bit so you can see a little bit more. Oh, come on. The actual movement of the movable jaw. Now I'm going to start it so you can see it a little faster. This is an impact crusher. It's an action mining 16 inch impact crusher. Five horsepower motor. Drive shaft. And then it goes to the actual impact head. Now, in an impact mill, you have a rotor and a chamber. Typically in the chamber you're going to have impact points that are going to tend to wear out. These should be easily hard faceable, replaceable, whatever you need. The rotor itself, these impactors have very high wear rates in general and they need to be easily replaced, easily resurfaced. So now that you've seen them in action a little bit, Let's get down to some more specific application. We're dealing with very small to small operations. Fractions of a ton an hour, a couple tons an hour, something like that. So, 
those constraints pretty much define what we're going to do. Then they have economic constraints which define it further. And so your basic micro scale or very small scale mining circuit goes like this. You're going to have a grizzly or a hand sort. You know, if it's small enough, you just look at the rocks, anything too big, you just smash it with a hammer. Okay? It'll go into a jaw crusher. From there, it'll usually go either to an impact or a rolls crusher, although sometimes you might use a ball mill. From there, it's going to go probably to screening so that you can regrind, and then the undersize goes to the extraction circuit. This will probably cover 90 to 95 percent of all small to micro scale gold mining operations. And the impact of the rolls are generally what you're going to be using. Uh, ball mills, again, because of their size and some of the other issues, rarely would you use a ball mill. So, figure, you can have a jaw crusher, maybe a secondary crusher. You might have a, if you're running a couple tons an hour, you might have, uh, say, a 8 by 10 jaw crusher, followed by a, a 12 by 12 rolls crusher, followed by an impact mill hard to tell, okay? But that's pretty much what you're probably going to be using on a micro scale. Anyhow, hope this was helpful. Happy prospecting and keep it safe out there.